Hello everyone, Altar Wisdom speaking. Today we're starting a new series. Uh, we're not going to deal with a tutorial of one of my Max devices or one of my VSC plugins. Uh, instead, we're going to start uh, actually building a device under Max for Life um, with me showing you and explaining what I do uh, as we go. And uh, the target of this is to build a kick device. Uh, of course, um, this session will and this device will mostly be related to Cytron's production, so we will focus quite a lot on uh, uh, Cytron's kicks, which have their specificities. But of course, uh, the key is also to be able to provide something as generic as possible. So it's going to have to be a bit versatile. Um, I think it's a very, it's pretty ambitious as a project because, uh, as you know, many uh, VST plugins already exist that are doing kicks. Uh, and pretty good ones. Uh, there are also some uh, kick devices uh, on the field. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. Um, but the key to that is not uh, only to just provide a kick and uh, send it to the world and hey, hey, this is a new kick, but the key is to show you as well uh, the fundamentals of uh, Max for Life uh, for those who are interested in this uh, purpose and uh, who wants to follow along the project and uh, go from uh, start, start going, going from scratch. And uh, these, uh, the various uh, steps and versions of the project will be uh, readily available for my Patreon supporters. So they're gonna have access, uh, early access to all the intermediate versions. So they will be able to command them, to test them, and of course to provide feedback and maybe suggest uh, where we should go uh, at each step. Um, uh, I'll be uh, doing uh, sessions that uh, hopefully won't be too long, so I'll probably have to split the sessions because uh, I don't want to go about three hours of development and me explaining what I do. Uh, that could be quite indigest for, for most of you, but uh, hopefully you're gonna have something interesting and we'll have a way to exchange and uh, collaborate for, to some extent and grabbing ideas from you guys. So without further talk, let's get on to it. Well, uh, starting from zero, just open live. Um, and uh, the first thing we have to do is uh, create a device. Um, so we have the choice of audio effects, instruments, and media effects. So what we want to do here is create an instrument. So we're going to add a new Max instrument, which is pretty basic, pretty empty at the moment. So we'll just open it. It's going to open uh, Max. And uh, you can just double click on there to grab to have a, uh, it uh, uh, full screen. Um, so what do we have here now? We have uh, these sections of blocks. So we have this block that I can drag around, which is called MIDI in, and this block which is uh, plug it out. Um, all this is just comments, so we're gonna remove them. They're just useless. Uh, MIDI in is pretty uh, self-explanatory. It's uh, where the uh, MIDI notes will uh, come inside the device and plug out is going to be the audio out of the device. So it's pretty simple. Uh, but uh, without starting to uh, create things and uh, connect stuff together, I think it's uh, the right moment to do some specifications. So um, we're going to uh, go on the project and uh, see um, uh, what we intend to do and try to build uh, the different steps that are needed for uh, our plugin creation. So um, I'm gonna just write down here. So uh, very simple in Max, if you want to make a text block, uh, I'm gonna create a comment. Uh, but first, what I want to do is uh, deal with this uh, thin line. Uh, which actually represents the device uh, as it will be displayed in Ableton. So it means that, um, as you can see here, we are 
somehow seeing the skeleton of the device here, which is usually not what you want to do. Uh, what you want to see is a visual representation uh, with an with an out, uh, outlay with an, uh, a nice graphical stuff, etc. And not the bit, the bits and bytes which are inside your devices. So to do to do so, I'm gonna right click anywhere uh, in the uh, Max window, open the inspector, and ask uh, Max for Live to. Uh, open that project in presentation mode, which means that uh, the project uh, will then by default be open in this uh, nice graphical mode that we still have to do, of course. So now I can switch to presentation mode and design mode. So you see in presentation mode, I have these lines, but uh, nothing by default is displayed. And uh, if I switch to regular mode, edit mode, then uh, I will not have this and I can do whatever whatever I want. So um, we're gonna uh, start saving the project. So that's usually a good, a good idea to save uh, as soon as possible. So um, let's call it, um, we can change the name later on, but it's gonna be kick, um, let's call it AOW. And that's going to be V0.1. I mean, it's just the first uh, iteration. I like to have this uh, version increasing and storing them uh, all, all here. Of course, some people will do some source management and uh, using GitHub or things like that. But it's uh, uh, for this, it's uh, just one file. So it's not really a complex uh, source management. So let's write it down. So I have created this file. And now the second thing I want to do so is writing some elements on the specification. So pressing C will just add a comment on the on the edit mode. So I can type down uh, anything. As you can see, it's black on uh, the, the choice of color by default is not uh, the, the better for me. So I'm going to change the color. And I'm going to put that in uh, um, like, like so. Convenient. Oh no, sorry, that's not what I want to do. It's the text I want to change. And now I have this text block in which I can do whatever, whatever I want. A uh, few tips and tricks, so I can grab and move this, move it around. Uh, I can zoom in uh, using uh, command equal or control equal in the windows. So that's simple. And I can zoom out using control minus or command minus in the macOS. So it allows me to go wherever I want and zoom. So let's zoom a bit on the specification part and correct the wording. So um, what do we need now? Uh, and uh, of course, I've <laughs> everyone knows, uh, now many of you at least know what a kick is. So basically what we need is uh, a sound source, because actually that's some sound, a sound source, um, mainly a uh, sound source which will be controlled by uh, some uh, envelopes. So we'll have an amp amplitude envelope. And we'll have as well a pitch envelope, as uh, usually a kick is made of a uh, fast, uh, fast pitch down uh, sound source. So pitch envelope as well. Um, then uh, we will need to have some MIDI processing because um, this uh, uh, device will have to be triggered by incoming MIDI. And uh, we optionally, and this is something that we'll need to deal with is it's going to be uh, post effects. Um, I'm talking about uh, anything which is related to compression, uh, saturation, drive, all the kind of stuff that you can find in some kicks. Um, these are not that much used in inside transproduction, especially drive is usually not used uh, or just slightly. Uh, compression a bit more. And there are some schools on this uh, on this topic because if I have the full control on the amplitude envelope, then usually why would I need uh, to compress that? So this is something we'll have to discuss maybe. Um, what else? And we'll have of course to work on the graphical interface. And um, also a good point is uh, talking about um, 
how we're going to render uh, the kick once it has been designed. Uh, so we can say, OK, I'm going to use it as a MIDI and then using the render, uh, integrated render in life. Or maybe we'll have to just render in place. So just create a wave clip or wave file uh, directly from the device to be able to drag it out and use it whenever we want or save it somewhere. So this is also wave file uh, render and export. Uh, I may, uh, I'm probably missing a few points and all of these uh, don't have the same complexities. Um, on top of that, uh, for each of these steps, there are a lot of ways to do them. So we're going to have some to make some choices about uh, how we go. Um, so that's a pretty simple specification. I don't want to go too deep in the details. Um, kind of an incremental guy, much more than just uh, putting all the stuff and having all the details written down and then just starting to work. Because you never know if you have a made of flow in your design, then you have to come back anyway. So working incre incrementally is usually, usually a good, my, that's at least my approach. Um, I want to cover just a, a tiny bit of how Max works. Uh, as you have seen already, um, you have these blocks. So Max is actually a, a block uh, programmation environment, a framework, in which uh, you have signals and messages which flow from the top to the bottom, and, uh, and anything which is uh, inside Max will work this way. Uh, so median will correspond to uh, the notes that would arrive from the left of the device from here. So a MIDI note which will be played on the on the clip here will get inside the device. And then it's up to me to decide what I want to do with the message which I receive. So the note, the pitch, the velocity and all the information that you can receive in the, from, a, from within the clip. So somehow we're going to have blocks here. And at the end of the day, we have this plug out, which will receive a left channel audio and a right channel audio. So it's pretty simple. But of course, uh, the reality is uh, um, much more complex. Um, so we have two types of things happening. We have a message flow and we have signal flow. Message flow is usually um, like a triggering comments inside Max. Signal flow is uh, usually where the audio passes. So if I'm dealing about real-time processing, uh, message flow will usually happen quite slowly. Um, and typically in Max for Life, uh, messages are happening every uh, 64 samples. But uh, of course, it's just a for a raw, uh, a raw approximation. It's of course not this way it works, the way it works. Whereas signal flow is happening uh, in real time at audio rate. So if you're uh, 44.1 kilohertz, then uh, the message will flow at the same speed. Um, the impact of that is that uh, whenever you're dealing with signal flow, you have to be a bit more cautious about not doing things too heavy in terms of, of computation because uh, each computation that will, you will do will happen uh, at your sample rate. So it's, uh, of course, it can easily uh, overflow your CPU and uh, get your device very, very inefficient CPU-wise. There are some objects which are uh, very useful. Um, and uh, they have usually uh, key commands, so the bank type B, the bank allows to send a message to something which is below. So if I click on it, uh, then a message, which, uh, which, which we call a trigger, will be sent downward. So I can do whatever I want. Uh, the second one is the message itself. So typing M will allow me to create what is called a message. And as you see, uh, all these boxes have uh, there are these inlets and outlets. So inlets are on the top and inlets and outlets are at the bottom. So uh, of course the inlets are very, very different. Uh, here you see this blue inlet and here you see this red inlet or pink, whatever. Uh, blue inlet is what is called in Max a cold inlet, whereas red inlet is called a hot inlet. What do that mean? It means that anything which arrives through a cold inlet will be stored by the box contained 
but will not trigger anything, any processing. It will just be stored for later use. Anything arriving on a hot inlet will actually store the information, but as well will trigger the computation. Uh, let's do an example. Let's say that I have this F command, which allows me to create a floating box. So that's a number. And I can drag down, I'll drag down or option drag down to have a second one. And I want to compute the addition of this one. So I'm going to add. So I'm going to have uh, create a box. Double clicking allows me to create an empty box. And I want to say plus. I want to add these two values. And as I want to do the, the, the computation in floating points, so with the decimals, I'm going to say that this plus is happening on the floating points, like so. So I can rescale this and I'm going to connect this right number to the cold inlet and the left number to the hot inlet. And now what I want to do is get the computation. So I'm going to add the third floating point box and to see the actual result of that. What, what is happening is that if I change the value here, you see that nothing happens. I mean, the computation is not done at all. The reason for that is that I'm using the cold inlet. But wherever I start triggering the right inlet, then you see that I'm actually having this addition taken into account the value, the last value that has been received on the cold inlets. And this is very important because sometimes you want to have something happening and uh, for some reason it doesn't. So bear in mind that sometimes it's going to happen on the wrong inlet. Uh, of course, there is a workaround to make sure that uh, I'm going to have this computation happens anyway. And this is done using the trigger um, button. So it's very simple. Double clicking. T, which means trigger. And the trigger will uh, do several things. It will receive anything that is passed to its its hot input, because I had hot inlet, there's only a hot inlet, and it'll, it will trigger various things um, uh, consecutively. Uh, keep in mind, and it's a very important thing, that things are happening from the right to the left. So anything which is done from here will happen before anything happens here. So anything is uh, uh, from the outlets is happening from the right to the left. It allows us to have to know in which sequence things are happening is very important. So what will I do if I want to have this uh, things compute? I will have to trigger, of course, uh, two things. The first thing is going to be a bang. A bang is this thing that we see here. And of course, we want to we want to trigger a floating point. So I'm going to send also the floating point. Let's say so I click on that connector and I move it to my bank to my trigger. So, uh, but now I have these two outputs. What should I do with this? This one, so this the run to the right corresponds to this one, so it's the float. So it should be connected to this entry because that's where my number is actually going. But what have what what can I do with this the, with the left one? The left one is the bang, and on this, if I right click on that and open the help for plus, you see that receiving a bang performs the addition with the numbers currently stored. It means that if I send a bang here, I'm going to trigger the addition. So let's try that only with a manual bang. So I'm going to change the numbers. So far, nothing is happening. But if I trigger the bang here, so I have, for, for example, one, and this value is not triggered, I'm going to click it. And now I have the actual value. But I don't want to have to click on that bang each time I want to do the computation. Instead, I can do that for visual. Visually, it's going to be better. And you see that as I move this uh, value, you will see the bang happening. So each time I change the number, it sends the value here that I can watch on the cable and a bang here. Of course, this bang is useless because this actually is a bang, so I don't need to add another bang button. So I'm going to remove this one and just skip the bang, uh, the, the B message from here. So now I have an object which is able to compute on whatever input I change.
So that, these were the two points which are very important. So uh, I wanted to spend a bit of time on this because uh, I'm going to make a lot of use of this uh, of these tricks. Um, the message as well has uh, two inputs. I'm using. I'm going to be using quite a lot of messages. Um, it has a right inlet, which is a cold one, and a red one. Um, using the right one will allow to allow us to store the value, whereas the left one will output the existing value. So if I add a new floating point here, I'm going to connect my floating point there. So what will happen is that my message will be updated, but not the output. For that output to, to happen, I'm going to add a bank. And if I click on the bank, now I have my, I, I have my, value, my value. So it's pretty simple, but you have to have this, this in mind if you want to deal with, uh, with Max for Life, because it's really critical uh, to understand how it works. So with all, with all this said, we can just remove all that and start uh, working. Um, of course, I'll explain things as we go. So don't worry if you uh, don't understand everything. I'll try to explain. And uh, using the comments uh, on the on the video section um, will allow me for uh, a part, uh, any part of this uh, these sessions, uh, to explain and to answer the questions which have been asked on the previous one, which. Uh, I think is going to be a nice uh, way to uh, progress together. So let's start with the sound source of our kick. Um, of course, I think you know that a sound, the sound source for a kick plugin is usually a sine wave, uh, though we can have some uh, more complex stuff like using harmonics, but uh, for now, I think a, a sine wave is going to be uh, the most uh, versatile uh, uh, sound source. So I'm just double clicking and I'm going to add which uh, the object which corresponds to the sine wave and it's called cycle. So it's cycle with a tilde. Uh, tilde means that an object is dealing with audio rate material and of course cycle is an audio rate material because it's going to create the actual sound. Um, one thing that we know is uh, that the kick is by default a mono signal. So for now, I'm, gone. I'm not planning on creating a stereo kick, uh, though with something which is doable. So we're going to start with just one signal. And what I want to do is just plug that signal. As you see that the, 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 the cables are very different to the output. So uh, we don't hear anything. Uh, because the signal, because the cycle by default is starting like at one hertz, something which is not, uh, which which you can't can't hear. So if I hover on the cycle, I see to the left is a signal float which corresponds to a frequency, and to the right it's the phase. If I want to impose a phase, so what I'm going to do is create a floating point. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to increase that value to fix a phase. And let's say I'm going to create 110, which means A. And with that, I usually uh, will be able to see uh, a sine wave. Of course, we're not hearing anything for now because I haven't put the sound. But what we can do is uh, see what's happening. So double clicking uh, on this, I can add the object, which is called a live scope, which which this is the scope, and connect the cycle to it. And instantly we see that we have something going on, which I can change. So if I change the value of the of the frequency, you see that the the rate of the the, the signal is going slower. And now we clearly see the sine wave, which corresponds to a signal. Simple. Gonna save. And now, uh, what are we gonna do? Um, to control that, um, we, uh, we're gonna need to uh, trigger uh, both a pitch envelope and an amp envelope when a MIDI note comes in. Um, for now, we're not going to deal 
that much with the media, we'll see that later. I only want to have that sequence happening, so at least uh, on the pitch and on the amp envelope. I'm um, going to start with something which is uh, easy, uh, which is an amp envelope, so live ADSR, which allows me to create an ADSR, and this one will control the pitch. And I'm gonna need a second one which con will control the amplitude. Um, these tools are very nice and they are quite recent in, uh, in, uh, in Max for Life because they have this UI which allows you to design the values from the uh, graphical, from a graphical interface. We'll see later that it's probably not sufficient for what we want to do on a kick, but it's a good starting point. So you see a lot of outputs there. So here we have the uh, attack time, decay, sustain, release, etc. And we have the same inputs there. So that's going to be the attack here. So what I'm going to do is connect the attack here, the attack here, the decay, the sustain, the release the initial value, the peak value, and the basically final value. We're gonna have as well the attack slope, which is an interesting point, uh, decay slope, and a release slope. Uh, of course, I don't wanna do that twice, so I'm gonna select both, the two of these, and copy the whole stuff, like so. And um, here we have what is called the trigger. So the trigger is uh, creating a value here from here. So for example, if I send here the ADSR, let's remove that. So I have zero because my, my envelope is not, is not triggered. And now I have triggered my envelope. So I have a one there, so it's up. And now if I want to go down and release and trigger the release, I'm going to send a zero. And now I'm back to zero. Pretty simple. One, zero. And I have my envelope working. So this is going to be sent to the cycle to control the frequency. Uh, of course, these values uh, should be uh, changed uh, because as you, as you see, the attacks seem to be instant, which is probably a nice point and the release has absolutely no control so we're gonna have to control that and anyway uh, if we are doing with a kick uh, the sustained value will gonna will will be zero probably like so and we're gonna have a release uh, a decay slope of a certain value so like this like this way so that's probably too fast and we will see how we can uh, configure this one. So seeing what what I call what what is called the inspector, I just press command E command I or control I on the on the windows and it displays the properties from the from the any object which I'm clicking to set its parameters. So what I want to do here is make sure that my kick won't be too long. So the attack domain anyway is gonna be zero. Zero because I have no absolutely no attack. Usually I don't want to have any attack on my kick, but we'll see if we want to change that. So attack slope doesn't have any meaning, attack time as well. Uh, then the decay domain, uh, I don't want a decay to happen up to 20 uh, seconds. So the decay is going to be between 1.5, which is okay-ish, and let's say one second, which would be, uh, which would be a full um, a full quarter at uh, 60 BPM. So it's pretty, it's pretty slow, but whatever. And the decay time by default or now should be like uh, 400 milliseconds. And the release uh, won't have any sense as well because each time I'm gonna uh, trigger the kick is gonna do a one shot so there won't be any release. So I'm gonna say zero, zero as well. And then we can uh, trigger that and see that we have that shape happening each time I press on one. So this will be connected to the frequency, but uh, the output of the ADSR is uh, a number between zero and one. So if I want to display, to see uh, what is the actual value here, I have these 
number thing, which is number tilde, which allows me to monitor the value, the actual value of a signal. So if I connect that to my live ADSL, I will see that oh, it's going to one and then to zero. So of course it doesn't mean anything uh, to, 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 the, to the kick. So I'm gonna have to convert that somehow to the minimum and maximum values that uh, the pitch can take on a kick. Uh, so let's say for now that I'm gonna have a kick which uh, will have a root note at say 50 Hertz and uh, which maximum pitch will be uh, 10,000. So I'm gonna scale, so I'm gonna use the scale tilde value and I'm gonna scale uh, between the, the incoming zero to one values of my ADSR to 50 and 10,000 of, uh, of my pitch. So if I connect this here, and I trigger that instead. You see that I'm way above any value. So I need to reamp this one somehow. So I want to display something between 40 and 10,000. So if I trigger now, I see that I have my values, which are actually going from 50 to 10,000, which uh, gets us pretty much in the ballpark for okay. So let's connect that to the cycle and now if I trigger this let's monitor what's going out of the cycle and so again we'll be, we are between minus one and one which are the values from audio if I click here and I trigger the kick you see that I see an acceleration of my pitch and going down so it's exactly what we want of course, what I want to do here is control the uh, control that uh, that envelope, so I can use this and uh, I can just lower this value. Even further, gotta put the headphones so I can just listen to it and not uh, bother you with some looping feedbacks. So we have a basic kick. It's of course not very convinced. I'm not very convinced with that. So typically what we want to do is control various things. Uh, here we want to control the pitch range. So let's say that I want to be able to control that. So for that, for this, I'm going to use the live dial, which brings us that nice knob that you probably know because it's everywhere in live, though I'm not using that much, uh, that much in my projects. And on this, I want to configure it as a frequency. So I'm going to set it to uh, let's say between 30 uh, and let's say it's no sense at all between 30 and 250 and it's gonna be uh, Hertz and that's gonna be the min frequency and I'm gonna connect that to the inlay which corresponds to the output the low output values and so it will replace the 50 which is here whenever I touch it and the second one is gonna be the max frequency and this one will start say 1000 and 12,000 we'll see later so not 100. What's later if that's okay and I'm gonna connect it to the second outlook and so if I now monitor that, me, my values will change. And let's say I want my kick to start at 40 Hertz and go upward to 6 Hertz, 6 kilohertz. 
I can try to show the values. It's not me. So you see that now my value is the release value, which is cor which corresponds to that. And if I activate the kick, then I'll have that values following. Now I can just change my envelope and play with it. As you can hear, my kick is not stopping at all. Why was the reason of that? Is because I haven't put any amp envelope on it. Okay, that's pretty uh, annoying, so uh, we gotta get rid of this uh, low rumble, <laughs> permanent low rumble. So um, now let's say that um, we're gonna use this, this amp envelope, and uh, what we're gonna do is use that envelope to. Uh, modulate the volume of our kick. So how are we going to do that? We're just going to multiply the two signals. So we were using a multiply tilde, which means multiplying audio signals. And instead of going directly from the cycle to the audio output, we're just going there. So if I want to select different uh, several cables at the, at the same time, just put Alt or Options and just drag around and all the stuff, uh, all the cables will be selected. If I do that on uh, without pressing Alt, then I'm just selecting the blocks. What I want to do is select the, select the cables now. So on top of the rest. So this cycle will be multiplied. What I, we don't care. As you can see here, both inlets of the multiply are Red. It means that both entries are hot. Um, so whatever is happening on each of the entries is going to take into account at the exact next uh, sample. Uh, and we're going to multiply this live ADSR with the signal. So we have this end envelope with it uh, has been configured, but we're going to change it as well. So I uh, would probably uh, have to reuse the same. Um, the same amp envelope, by the way. So, uh, listen, this is what we're gonna do. We can remove this one. I can copy um, this one, or maybe do it even simpler. Just remove everything and copy the whole thing again there. So I got all these settings for the ADSR already set up for us. I'm gonna multiply the ADSR here. Uh, it doesn't matter if which one is on which one because it's uh, commutative, this multiplication. And so we have one trigger which triggers the amp and the second one which triggers the, um, the pitch. So what we're gonna do is uh, send, uh, trigger them at the same time. So instead of having two of these messages, I just have one and it's gonna be triggered by the same uh, the same message, so just let's have a listen. Try again with the sound up. So we still have the rumble. Um, let's have a scope on this and the envelope to make sure that it's working fine. Yeah. So it's still at one. Zero here. Yeah, now we gotta, we gotta stop. So this one is probably not set up. We get the system. Um, yeah, the amp envelope has to be set up. So usually, what you want to do is uh, sending uh, this envelope to this one. So, envelope active. Uh, if I just monitor this one and see what's happening, you see that if I trigger the amp and the pitch envelope. Thing. But what we want to do is make sure that uh, we will 
go to the end and kill the the amp as well so this is a one shot stuff so we have to figure out a way to change this so let's give it a try this way i want the one envelope to trigger the zero so what will happen is that we will trigger the beginning of the envelope and instantly we're gonna trigger the end of this envelope so let's see if it fits works if it works doesn't so the envelope is not even stopped so that's weird what are we gonna do use the trigger button that we have discussed a bit earlier so i want to trigger first a one so i want to activate the envelope and then a zero so as you see as you know uh, it's working from the right to the left so what i want to do is trigger firstly uh, the one message and i want to start my envelopes and then the zero message to stop them they will happen almost instantly but we'll, i'll show that this one will happen first and to control that i just need to set out a bank like so and now let's see no better um, just uh, get rid of these messages so I can't be I can't seem I don't seem to be able to to trigger because I as soon as I send a zero then I have my res envelope so this is zero so instead of using the decay which finally is not useful we're gonna change the release and that's gonna be the release which will control the end of the kick so the decay is useless but we have the release slope the release here and we need to have a sustain um, we can do that here sustain at maximum so one like so and the release which controls the amp here envelope and now if i trigger my envelope not yet so um after a bit of trial and error i'm able to trigger the envelope so for that what did i do first uh, i'm gonna make sure that the envelope is not running so with a zero then i'm gonna trigger it and finally i'm gonna shut it down with the pipe message which will delay the zero message uh, for about one millisecond that's far from being perfect uh, because i can't seem to be able to trigger the end of the uh, uh, of the envelope uh, before one millisecond so that's for me a major flow because we want to have something very precise um, one thing that you can do with live adsr is control it not using messages but directly using signals but for that um, uh, we have to uh, do some kind of trick because um, it really expects to have a zero message before even starting an envelope um, we're gonna make use of the click message which is click tilde which as the description says it creates an impulse uh, i can have a look at what click actually does it's triggered by bang and what happens when i click on that it actually triggers an impulse which lasts exactly for one sample so to trigger my kick instead of using messages i'm going to remove this one i'm going to i'm going to do it with the click so let's see i'm going to connect the click here and there as well and now i'll go trigger for them for the further from here better I can change a bit my pitch envelope a bit faster now we're getting in the ballpark so maybe that the maximum envelope is not good enough but we are definitely going uh, getting closer to a kick
So if I change the maximum pitch, we can have a kick which will be very bright or that will be smoother. Can go even lower. So this one is much more techno-ish than Cytrons, I would say, because uh, it's really, really a low one. And probably the uh, release envelope, the amp envelope is a bit too long. But we definitely have something which resembles a kick. However, uh, we have an issue here. This amp envelope uh, doesn't match what we usually are expecting in uh, a Cytron's kick. Uh, you know, that fishtail uh, shape that the env envelope has. And uh, with the initial transient, which is, which is at maximum volume, then uh, we have a curve, so some lower volume, and then back again to maximum volume when the pitch is uh, going down. So we want to have more control on this. So it, what it means is, is that a simple envelope is not, uh, is not what we want. Uh, instead, we're going to switch uh, to the function uh, mode. Uh, the function is uh, this, uh, the equivalent of what we, what, what we should call a, a multi-segment. Multi um, yeah. As you see, so it's a place where you can, you can tr draw things, uh, whatever you want, you can move them around, etc. And this one allows us to draw uh, the the shape that we want. So for my kick, it would be something like, uh, if that was the, the, the amp envelope, something like that. Of course, it's completely rough, uh, rough, rough estimation. And you see that it's adding points. It doesn't allow me to do curves because the function has to be converted as we configure to be uh, to use it as you want. So adding points by clicking, I think this is what we want. Changing sustain, uh, why not? I'm gonna just widen this a bit to be able to read it. Moving point by clicking, dragging, yeah. Auto sustain, I'll say off. Um, uh, display X axis, uh, what I want is something going from zero to one. Uh, great step. Uh, we are not displaying this, so it's not critical. The range for Y is between 0 and 1, which is pretty convenient. Uh, the output node is normal. We'll see uh, how it works. We don't want to snap to grid. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, maybe we want to make sure that we are able to do curves. So I to check uh, how you do that because kind of currently it doesn't allow me to do any it doesn't allow me to do curves sorry just copied things twice yeah something simple adding a message with the word clear and if i connect that here i think i'm able to clear the envelope so i'm gonna i got again an, uh, an empty envelope So I want to be able to draw curves here. So let's check on the uh, right clicking and open the help. And then we have attributes. So this is the, mess the list of messages that the object is expecting. So we have, for example, the clear that we just used. And we have the attributes which allow to configure the object from the, uh, from the, uh, from the outside. So we'll see that there is this mode thing which have default mode of line linear, but here what we want to do is curve. So we can send a message to the to the function. I think using um, mode one will tell it to use curves. And now if I draw things here, I should be able to change. No, it doesn't allow me to do so. So gonna do it like so. If I hover on it, I can click on this yellow thing 
and change the attributes. And I'm gonna find my I'm gonna find my mode. And it will allow me to change it. Oh, sorry again. And set to curve. And if I now alt click or command click or option click, I'm see I see that I'm able to change the values. So I'm gonna start from point zero here. Oh, don't want to add too many points. Shift click will allow me to remove them. So this is the minimum value. So I'm gonna do something like that. And then add in the, add the last point, which will, and this is, yeah, this is somehow the shape, the type of shape that we want to achieve with the pitch envelope. But how are we going to use that? So if I go again on the documentation, a function what kind of message so this one is sending a bank to the envelope will output the list of the current breakpoints formatted for the use for the line object um, yeah the issue here is that uh, we don't want to draw lines, we want to draw curves, so this is too simple for us. Yeah, let's check the documentation here. So as you see here, the way to use the curves is send place or set curve, or, because that's gonna change the curve, I don't care about that. But if I connect the second outlet to the curve message, then it's going to trigger the curve which is drawn here. And so this is probably what we want to do. So curve. And here, instead of using our live ADSR, I want to use the output here. Now I think I can remove all this. Maybe we'll use them later. Oh, sorry, not, uh, not there, but here. So that's a signal that we're getting. I'm going to remove this uh, uh, ASR. But um, before we do that, uh, what is happening here? Our function is going from 0 to... Uh, that's the x domain that we've seen earlier. So that's between zero and one. So that's not the length that we want to, to have to happen. So we need to set somehow the length of this. So let's grab a new slider. And the slider will trigger and we change the length of our function. So uh, how do we do that? So we have this domain. And what this information here means, um, if you're new to Max, if you want to display this, you need to cl click on the uh, ampersand, uh, no, not ampersand, not at uh, message. And it allows us to know which kind of message they're expecting. So uh, if I just create a message here, and the message would be, uh, sorry again, I just forget what it was. So that's ran, so that's uh, domain. So if I just add domain, and this is a very weird one, domain space uh, okay, dollar one, and I connect that here, and I connect that here. Let's see what it, what it does. Uh, to know what this thing is sending out, I'm gonna add a new message and monitor what this message contains. So if I move this thing, you see that it's basically creating a message which contains only the word domain and the value which is sent here. So it's gonna be sending this to my uh, to my function. If I open here, you see that my x-axis is now changing as I move the uh, as I move the, the knob. It's exactly what we want. Uh, the only issue is, as you see, that my uh, grid doesn't follow the uh, doesn't follow it's not scaled when I change the the lens so we have to figure out a way to do that as well so there is there must be some rescale uh, which we have to consider con consider configure here again let's switch to the description 
there is set domain. Yeah, that's better. The will set domain followed by float or int value sets the maximum display x value, then modifies the x value of all breakpoints so that it remain in the same place given the new domain. That's exactly what we want. So it's not domain that we want to use, but set domain, which is uh, which we actually do both uh, both of what we want. So I'm gonna clear uh, the end the the function. There we go. Now I'm going to draw some points and now I'm going to change the domain. Yeah, that's better. So my points are not moving, it, but, it, but the overall length of my curve is changing. So let's say, of course, I want to change that because it's not a frequency. So that's the amp length. Or duration, whatever. And this will be, say, between um, 50 milliseconds and maximum half a second, something like that. And it's gonna be displayed in milliseconds. So let's say I want a kick which lasts for 400 milliseconds and on the amp envelope. And uh, I'm gonna trigger um, this envelope using my initial click. Let's see if it works again on the function. I see that we can control the envelope as, as a signal, using a signal. But if I do so, I need to send the value here, which is uh, a bit uh, inconvenient. So I'm gonna do something else. Uh, so let's remove this amp envelope now, because we won't be using it. And I want to have my initial bank triggering two, uh, two banks, or just, yeah. No, no, this let's play it differently. I can directly connect here. One will send a click to the pitch envelope and the other one will trigger the dump of all, of all kick, of all completed kick, of the kick. So let's draw again our shape. Yeah, that's pretty approximate, of course. But I want to get us into ballpark. And so now if I trigger my envelope, at least it seems to do something. Let's have a look at our output signal. Yeah, I think this is exactly the type of shape we're looking to.